Welcome yeah. everybody to Equity Guru. Uh, with me here is Darren Trousdall from uh, Now Vertical. Uh, we should uh, uh, line out up front that Now Vertical isn't a client of ours. We just think it's a really interesting story. We're uh, very much uh, fans of uh, the movement towards AI and you guys have a little bit of exposure in that space. Um, and so, uh, you know, along with companies that we've talked about, like uh, uh, Amped uh, versus, uh, I think that having a good AI exposure in your portfolio is a good thing. Darren, uh, to those that don't know what Now Vertical does, how would you describe it in uh, in the three thousand foot terms? Yeah, we we help our customers, which are all enterprise customers, turn their AI investments or ambitions into what we call vertical intelligence, which is vertically specific applications of AI. So, you know, and that the point of that is automotive AI applications are vastly different than financial services. Sure. So you have to be specialized for it to work. And and like, what does that look like at the pointy end? Like if you could uh, walk us through like one of the, the integrations that, uh, that you've announced recently. Yeah, so... Um, you know, for our customers, um, you know, General Motors, one of our biggest customers, you know, uses our solutions to drive automation through their safety and uh, product lines. So they use our technology to identify safety issues um, from the past or present um, and do it on an automated basis so that they can put product in the streets that is uh, safe to drive. But it also spans to, you know, in retail, our, our one of our customers, Nike, uses our um, solutions and our expertise to help, you know, make their data available for use in a privacy safe way um, to enable, you know, better retail experiences. So it's, it's, it's very specific in the industries we serve, which we're not in every industry. We're in some very specific industries like automotive, financial services, retail, media, entertainment. Um, probably the, the the bigger adopters of uh, of this technology format. Got it. And and like for a company that's what ten million dollar market cap, be, having those big boys uh, playing with what you're offering is uh, is quite the validation. Yeah, the the market cap right now is about twenty five million. Twenty five um, sorry. Canadian. Uh, just but the data online, you know, we with our uh, share structure sometimes gets uh, mixed up. But you yeah. know, whether it's twenty five, even at a even at a hundred million, the uh, the work we're doing and our revenue profile, um, you know, is, is unique in the Canadian small cap space. Um, we are enterprise, you know, enterprise focused. There's 250 plus enterprise customers in our group, um, across, you know, all key major markets right now, U S Canada, Latin America, Europe, UK. Um, and we're growing through Europe and and into Asia with our ambitions. Now, you've got a lot of uh, one, one of the things that I find is is difficult for companies like yours um, that provide services to other bigger companies is a lot of the times your contracts will come in and you're not allowed to say who you're working with. Uh, I've, I've talked to uh, Pluralock, uh, info security company, and he's literally said, like, if I told you how clients were, I'd be arrested for treason. Um, how difficult is it to talk to retail about what you do when you're quite often under the commercial and confidence cloud? We, you know, it's important to us as a story that has to market itself that we can talk about our customers. There are customers in a couple of our verticals that have explicitly asked us not to, you know, put them in our promotional materials. Um, but, you know, we, we, what we like to identify and talk about our customers because it's the, our business is sold in the commercial and in the investment sense when we talk about the use cases, solving safety for GM, helping, you know, helping HBO Max identify like for like audiences to better, you know, target their content. You know, the things we do, it's very important we speak about our customers. So we are, we're, we're the opposite of that. Okay. Um, Inclu- sorry, including, including to your, your reference with, uh, with the cool company like Plur- Pluralock, which I'm a fan of, is... Um, our government space. We talk about our government uh, customers too. We have a large government business, including the Department of Defense, Department of State, Department of Energy now. Okay. So one of the things that's really attractive to me as an investor to companies that are doing business with those bigger boys is once you're hooked into their systems, it's really hard to unhook you. Like you have to be really screwing the dog at some later date to lose those contracts. The In this world, when you get in, you secure your assignment, you deploy your technology. It's very, very sticky. 
Um, you know, GM has been with the group for six years, um, as an example. These are, you know, our government contracts are multi-year, you know, right now backlogs, you know, $100 million over a three, four year period. They're very, it's a very, very sticky space in, you know, big data AI. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's it's exactly what you say. It's very difficult to un- unseat the incumbents, which, you know, you do have to mess up big or there needs to be a seismic shift in tech. So actually the, the opportunity is becoming greater for companies like now because, uh, the migration to cloud has really, you know, driven the uh, driven the uh, need for these solutions to exist, and we're only twenty percent of the way to cloud migration. Got it. So, so and when you bring on a new client, it's uh, you know, I, I imagine that what you're providing is really scalable. Uh, like, if 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 a client comes in that requires you to do some some coding, some uh, in that manner, now you've got a product that you can then farm out to other people that might be interested in that, right? Well, we have, you know, what we've built, you know, and our model is a little different because we've built this enterprise through 12 foundational acquisitions. And those acquisitions provided customer portfolio, uh, ge- geographic uh, reach, and it's also cr- it's provided uh, capability and solutions in region. So now like two specific things we're doing is offering our customers our engineering and data engineering and data science capabilities out of two lower cost regions now, which is in South America, Argentina, Brazil, um, and in India, two delivery models that are, that are really unique for, um, for our customers that they're leveraging, but they're going to get way better, um, yeah, way better time to value and way better cost savings than using the typical North American or even European models. Got it. One of the things that uh, that is difficult with uh, the emergence of AI on the public markets is the inevitability that suddenly every second company claims to be an AI company. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll take an outside, off, out of the box software, uh, adapt it in some way, and suddenly it's all over their news releases. You're a company that's been in the AI space legitimately for some time. Uh, how do you separate yourself from the the also rams? Uh, and really demonstrate to people that you are part of that that OG culture. Yeah, great, great question. So we've created our own terminology, which we call vertical intelligence. Because again, I'll, I'll reiterate, AI actually from an enterprise, you know, enterprise context is meaningless if it's not specialized or purpose built for industry. You can't take AI models from automotive and make them work in financial services or pharma or retail. Right. So we've been very specific about um, these are the verticals we specialize in. These are the experts we have on the team that are from industry that deploy and deliver the technology. And that's why our, our stuff works. And when you've got a generic software, whether it's, let's call it, you know, anything from chat GPT through, um, you know, an enterprise, you know, an enterprise data model. If it's not specific, it's 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 highly unlikely it's going to work, and therefore time to value for the customer is too long. Therefore, they will they will stop the project and no longer invest in it. For us, we have to create value immediately for our customers, and the specialization is how we do it. It starts with governance, provenance, compliance, making sure all their data is available for use and ready to be mobilized. We get paid. And, and integrate through the whole life cycle. And that's how we do it and how this has many, many, many years to scale. We're, we're, we're first, second in it. It kind of reminds me of the rise of blockchain where all these companies were saying, yes, we too are a blockchain company. And the first question really should have been, but blockchain and what? Right, Blockchain by itself isn't a thing. It's a way of doing a thing. Uh, and AI is in that same boat. It's like, it's great that you have AI somewhere in your com- corporate employee manual, but what are you actually applying it to and how is it different from whatever else is out there? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, I think right now, you know, the ambition in enterprise is there. The uh, C, the C-suite is committed to automation and bringing AI tooling into the enterprise. IT is sitting there going, that's all well and good, but, but we don't even know where our data assets are. We don't know what it is. Half of it's not compliant. So guess what, Mr. CEO? In certain jurisdictions, if, if this is messed up, you're going to jail. Yeah. And you know, we we help our customers at the beginning, middle, and end of this journey. 
And the end, nobody knows what the end is. I think there's a lot of Elon Musky talk out there about robots dominating the world and we're off to run to Mars. But, you know, I think the end right now in the next 10, 15 years is a really efficient, automated, software-driven uh, enterprise where decision-making is still human, but it's living by a set of rules that are put into the enterprise driven through technology. And that's going to make companies highly efficient, and it's going to put people into capacities and, and, and workflows that, that actually provide value to the enterprise. Yeah, this is my thing is like as a writer, primarily, I, you know, people uh, see AI coming and thinking, oh, well, you're going to be out of a job soon. And realistically, I think the only way that happens is if I'm in the lower 80th percentile of writers. Like if you're good at what you do, then robots shouldn't be able to take on what, you, what you're at. And the use of AI tools will allow me to be far better in terms of allowing me to research quicker and, you know, provide filler text that I don't have to sit and slave over. Like I see AI in every industry as being an opportunity for the best to get better and the pretenders to get shown up really quickly. It's, you know, my, my oldest daughter is in high school and she uh, came the other day and was talking about, you know, some of the boys in the class you know, using the AI tooling to do their papers and the teacher, and it was like really kind of an experiment, right? The teacher mm -hmm. didn't know they did this, put the papers in front of them. It was too obvious. Yeah. And there's, and, and the quality is getting better. Like it, it's going to get to a point where the, syn the synthesis is solid right now, though, you couldn't write an article that has voice and humanity and tonality that, you know, is Chris Perry's, tone from a from the ai it doesn't work yeah yeah um your stock is what i might call a trader's darling uh it, it's up in some periods it's down in some periods you can draw a line across it it's pretty much flat um over the long haul but there's definitely been a lot of activity uh in now uh what do you put that down to so i you know i, I just had this conversation this this whole week and you know one of our larger kind of retail shareholders and i were talking about it and now went public at the kind of you know second stage of the small cap bear market in canada we've never ever ever had a, a rally market on the, at all for the stock so it's never had a you know a momentum market like some of these other names that were maybe six months a year ahead of us in in, in going public yep um Every time we have a, a momentous event, but it, and like and more more likely or not, than not a financing, we get shorted in and we get shorted out and we take our lumps and then it bounces off wherever it bounces off and goes back to that sixty five to eighty cent range and we can't break that, even though the business quarter over quarter prints probably some of the best financials in in our you know, in our space. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know any tech story like us it, that's in our comparative set market cap wise that do anywhere near the financial profile we have and what's coming. What's coming is going to be an interesting catalyst because when we post our Q4 in early April and then the Q1 right after that, and, you know, we start to show positive EBITDA, not just the tech story and growth story, we're starting to show some real financial performance. I do have an expectation that when the market says we don't like unprofitable companies, I now expect that that market says, okay, here's a reward for, for doing what you said you were going to do. Right. So we'll do see. We'll see. Like to me. Do you think you also get discounted a little bit on the companies that go on acquisition sprees? Uh, you know, that reflects a, a lack of profit in the next quarter, right? Because you're allocating all that money to integrating and acquiring other companies the retail market doesn't always dig deep into those financials to see where the money went. They just look at that headline and say, oh, okay, lost $2 million. They're not looking at, but also gained $25 million worth of, you know, on recurring revenue. Yeah. I think that's possibly some of it. The, the real challenge right now for, for now and other good stories, small cap stories in Canada specifically, there's just, almost zero institutional support it's like sure. without an institutional backstop it's really hard for retail to take a story all the way because retail has to move in and out and traders have to move in and out so without that kind of you know belief institutional belief it's really difficult to kind of break out for real you could have 
you know, um, you can have promotional breakouts and things like that, but to break out where now should be or other stories with good financial profile should be, you you know, the market's going to have to, you know, the market's going to have to turn where institutional guys are, are jumping on stories. So retail investors generally are looking for a catalyst as a reason to get on today instead of tomorrow. Uh, do you see that catalyst coming for you? Or is this going to be just a situation where one day we wake up on a Wednesday morning and suddenly someone has figured it out that you're cheap, bought a big chunk of it, and it's never cheap again? I think the catalysts are, you know, I think our retail base knows what's coming, which are financials are coming, uh, two sets, you know, Q4, Q1, more m a um, you know, retail that we work with definitely understand our M&A story. There's a unique element in the story right now that we didn't have in the past, which is we have an organic growth story. We have growth from 22 to 23 and seeing that kind of show up in the quarters um, in the existing business is attractive. And, and, and those, ca- those drivers and catalysts are easy for retail to understand without having to you know, pull out the abacus and read through every you know, element in an MDNA. Mm-hmm. They can see it because it's clear as day. It maps to what we're saying as the management team of what we're doing. Um, and it's, it, you know, in our model, in fairness to the market, you know, our model is lagging um, because we do an acquisition and you won't see that in the financials until it closes and it's, you know, wrapped in and there's, that could be four months. Right. So, you know, that, that, those are the factors, but catalysts definitely are here. It's it's interesting. Like we mentioned earlier, Pluralock is a, a company that's kind of comparable in that they've also rolled up a bunch of uh, of targets, uh, not necessarily been given the love on the on the markets for it, even been shorted at at times when the news is positive. Um, but I, I feel like Canadian tech, uh, or at least Canadian listed tech, often gets this this discount. It doesn't have that built in retail support that is that is there for the whole run. It's very much kind of a an in and out kind of audience that we're talking to. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, if you go back through your uh, news releases, of which there are plenty, it's all have acquired this, uh, have done business with this company, have done repeat business with this company. Uh, you, you, everything is either successfully doing business, successfully acquiring business, or successfully getting a financing at times when not many people are getting good financings. Uh, you, you seem to be delivering on the promises that you've made. If you had your time over, if you could do the last year over again, would you have done it differently? No. Maybe maybe in this last financing, we would have, which is even when I, when I do a postmortem on this last financing, which, you know, we just are coming off a beating on that, that one. I think we, we've had a great partnership with, our, you know, our core investment bank, Echelon, has really done great work with us. We introduced, you know, some new players in this last one. And, and it really, you know, the way we work and the way we execute financings, which have always been super successful, um, had a little bit of uh, had a little bit of a different flavor this time. So we didn't like the flavor. So mm-hmm. next time, if we if if we choose to do something, we're going to go with what we know and, and where we've been happy. So this is a, you know, not trying to promote. Um, an investment bank here, but the guys at Echelon did a phenomenal job in the story from when it was nothing. When people look forward, uh, it, we're a company that's just doing a lot of acquisitions. It, sometimes it's nice to have a little period where the acquisitions stop for a bit, just to let the financials kind of settle in and people get a, a clearer picture of where things are at. Is, is that something that we will see coming for you? Or as you mentioned, the next two quarters, or is the next two quarters the point where the revenues that you've been rolling in, like really the rubber really hits the road. Our model and business model requires us uh, not in any particular specific timeframe, but it requires us to continue to add accretive assets to our our group so that we can bring more cash up to corporate. And we have finance and capability outside of equity um, to do this. We have, uh, you know, we have bank lending partners, you know, our last deal was with TD Bank and, and EDC in Canada. We work with, you know, players like that to get deals over the line. Um, we're only interested right now in creative assets uh, for the moment. So although there's amazing value out there in software and technology, 
Um, still majority is all money losing, you know, so it doesn't map to our model with, yep. you know, our, our positive EBITDA play and, and focus. So, um, you know, this quarter, you know, it's, you know, we've, we've been really busy integrating what we have and doing this financing, getting set up for the next wave next quarter, you know, it's uh, highly likely you'll see, see more stuff. Okay. Which and explains everything. raising money. Yeah. yeah. If if you could wave your wand and have the Canadian government do something that would help uh, companies in your particular business model uh, to scale quicker, is there a thing that, that that would really help? Well, we're beneficiaries now of the Canadian government backing our international acquisitions through EDC. In the EDC program, there's two things in, in that EDC is doing for Canadian companies investing globally, which is direct lending at you know favorable rates and terms and doing this program which is called egp which they're uh, guaranteeing bank loans for similar place so like a td or a scotia or a bmo as an example find it difficult to do lending in certain in certain countries like it just doesn't map to their model they yep. like us they like canada the edc has a has a program to guarantee a portion of those loans in these in these different jurisdictions so I'm benefiting and the company's benefiting from the government right now in Canada. I think overall, though, as a participant in private markets, public markets in Canada, um, there is not, we still are not doing a great job supporting the tech scene because even the government kind of jumps to momentum and the, the Canadian market's very momentum driven. Mm-hmm. So if it goes back to mining, the Canadian government's all of a sudden, you know, really long on mining. If it goes heavily tech, then they'll start turning the, the corner. But the Canadian government has to realize that technology, t- tech, just like the U.S. has in a lot of ways, is absolutely paramount to, to our future as a country. And mining and commodities is a very important aspect. But there's only so much land and so much ground we can drill into Tech is an infinite opportunity for our for our country. So they need to get it, they need to, to to double down on that, regardless of momentum. And so the, I guess that for the for the average retail investor, uh, that the message should really be the same. It's that you know technology uh, has that higher risk, perhaps because sometimes it's not assets that you're investing in; it's ideas. But the upside, uh, you know, it just it goes off. Yeah, it, it's, it's it, it, there's no cap, and so what you want to be looking for is uh, for mine. If I'm doing due diligence, I look at a company like yours, where every one of the companies that does business with you has had to not only due diligence to make sure that your what you're selling works and is a good deal, but that you'll be there in two or three years, right? Like GM doesn't do business with a company that might not be around in six months. If they're going to do business with you, they are locked in exactly what you are, exactly what you're sitting on, and, and the fact that you'll be ever present. Well, we're, we're winning, you know, some of our units, so our guys in Latin America, our guys in UK, they're winning business, but they wouldn't have won without being part of the group. Right. You know, public, you know, regardless of our market cap and share price, which if it was heading in a different direction, it would probably help us there too. But the, um, you know, Having the infrastructure, the global infrastructure, the insurance platform, the, the all the things these companies require, like the insurance requirement to take on a significant enterprise commercial contract now is is really meaningful and actually prices out a lot of great small companies who could be doing great work. They can't afford the five, ten million dollar basic liability insurance that an enterprise customer is going to require. Got it. Uh, is there one thing about your company that you wish the market understood better than it does? We're, you know, we're a commercially led company. We go, we win business, we service business, we make money. Like that's what we do. We're not a, we're not a promotional story. We're not a, if this happens, then that happens, then that happens and it'll be magical. We're doing it. Like under, under the market's nose, we're executing a business. And I think that, we're, and we're printing it in the financials. They gotta, they, they, they gotta look at this stuff. Like, what, you know, as a market participant myself, like I look at a few things in a company that make it investable to me. Our company, number one, 
insider ownership is very significant. We have, you know, we started where we were the majority, we do a public. Now, you know, we're still around 40%. You know, management owns 40% of this company. Then you go to um, 250 customers. So even in macro headwinds, we just focus on share of wallet expansion. We have business for years to expand upon. 250 customers. Right now, those customers are doing two, three things with our group. They could be doing 10. And then lastly is we have a team in industry. They're experts. They've been servicing this this, uh, industry for years. They are the foundational brains behind real AI, not the scientific AI. I mean, automation, machine learning tools that actually work in industry. And you put those things together, this is a story to invest in with, with a perceived result at the end of the rainbow, which is um, real financials, real exit potential, or real enduring, long-standing global public company. There's, there's, there's so much data being drawn in in the world today, uh, which 99% of it never actually gets looked at by anybody, right? It just goes into a database. Um a company that I've been, we mentioned Versus earlier on, and and part of their business model is to be able to get all of this data into one place to talk to itself, process, and then present it in a way that actually can be actionable. Um, to me, this makes a lot more sense than chat GPT. You know, the, the chat GPT can go and do a whole bunch of things, but presenting something to you in an actionable way on a regular basis that takes all the data that companies already spend so much money acquiring and bring it together in an actual sense. Like that it almost seems like there should be a different terminology from AI for that kind of thing. Like, like AI that works, AI that's actual. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, a, that's our whole model. So just like from the beginning, like what we do, the, the companies we've acquired and, and software we've acquired to work together, where is my data? What is my data? How is my data ready for use in compliance sense? Then now that it's known, we mobile, make it ready for use in mobilization. Then we fuse the data together, um, all data formats, structured, unstructured. And then when that data is fused together, real analytics can happen. And then you can layer on the automation right. and the, a, the industry-specific AI that will get outcomes. That's what our entire platform, that's what our business does. That's what been, been, we've been doing. Um, the first company we acquired has been doing it, you know, seven, eight years, you know, long before anyone else is talking about it. Chat GPT doesn't work without real data, real usable, clean, enriched, um, and, you know, NLP driven data made available to it. It, it becomes completely useless. Mm-hmm. So the value isn't the the bot. The bot's not the value. The value is how OpenAI has created a data engineering pipeline, made it available for use, and 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 how they've done it and make it work in real time. That's the magic. It's just there's no enterprise context there yet. Right. It always m- makes me think back to the early days of the internet. I was on the internet in 1994, before mm-hmm. the browser was a thing. And it was great and all, but it was only when the browser came about so people could actually like visually make use of the internet that it suddenly took off. And I feel like AI is in this exact same place. You guys are the Netscape that are bringing together all that raw data and putting it in a place where grandma can make sense of it. And, and, and right now, you know, there's the consumer side of this, which is really exciting. And you can see Facebook, you know, this week, major shift from metaverse to AI, which seems to be the thing to do right now from your, you know, IR perspective, right? Right. You know, but a Facebook, you know, thinking about communities, you know, use cases, Facebook has the most to gain and the most, the the, the right to win around building cool AI in the consumer context, right? Enterprise for the, maybe, maybe on the advertising side, they also can do something really cool there. Google the same thing. How do you, really enable, um, you know, their 28 million customers. We just put out a product actually that does archiving of Google and I'll just, we had a, so much demand in, in source in this data, we made a product. Mm-hmm. Things like that are all just fueling automation and Google and, and, and the, uh, you know, the, the, the large incumbents have so much to, to gain from, you know, really adopting this strategy. 
Well, man, I, I I think this is going to be a roller coaster ride for you for uh, for a while. Uh, as much as the stock goes up and down in the short term, I feel like it's going to make sense to a lot of people going forward as they see the the realistic nature of, of what you're building uh, and the fact that you're not going away. So, congrats on what you built so yeah. far. Clearly, there's a there's a group of investors out there that see the value in what you're doing, understand it, and are okay with short term falls. Uh, and they're rewarded with the longer term rises. So uh, good job. All right. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, I appreciate that you're focusing on the topic here because it's important. It's important in the Canadian context. We have an opportunity to be a leader in this space. So thank you for doing your thing. All right, man, as far as I can see, this is going to be the next internet. And uh, those that, that aren't paying attention are going to miss out. I totally agree. It's uh, Darren Trostall from uh, Now Vertical, NOW is the ticker symbol. And again, uh, not a client, just uh, an interesting story that we think uh, you guys should be aware of.